nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. I'm Alejandro Strack and I'm a professor of materials engineering at Purdue University. And one of the hats I wear is we run NanoHub. We thank all of you for joining in and uh, let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Davis McGregor. He's a senior manufacturing scientist at Fast Radius. Uh, it's a cloud manufacturing company. And he got his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, actually earlier this year. And he's uh, very interest in, interested in uh, manufacturing, and this is uh, what he's going to uh, tell us about how to uh, combine machine learning with manufacturing. So, uh, Davis, take it away. Thank you to everyone for uh, tuning in today. I'm very excited to give this talk. It's a, a topic I spent a lot of time working on when I worked on my dissertation, and then now it still plays into my job at, at Fast Radius. Um, so, uh, we've all tuned in today, hopefully to learn a little bit more about machine learning and how we can apply it to uh, different types of situations. But specifically, uh, in today's tutorial, I'm going to uh, show how we applied this to uh, predict the quality of additively manufactured parts or 3D printed parts. Uh, and specifically, we're going to be walking through the tutorial using a support vector regression model, uh, which is just one of the many uh, machine learning algorithms that are available. Before we jump in, I, I do want to give credit to the rest of the team here. Um, you know, this is born out of some of the research I did during my dissertation. Uh, it's a very collaborative effort, um, and so they are also do uh, quite a bit of credit for this work. Uh, a little bit of background on additive. Uh, it, basically, it's a process of creating parts through adding additional material, uh, as opposed to more traditional manufacturing or subtractive manufacturing. Uh, such as milling, where you're removing material in order to shape your part. Uh, now, this is a $15 billion industry, so it's no longer just for prototyping or hobbyists. Like, this is increasingly being adopted uh, for production applications. Uh, and whether you know it or not, you've probably interacted with 3D printed parts before. Uh, they're in automotive industry, aerospace, uh, consumer grade uh, products. Uh, they are uh, all over the place, and uh, you have most likely encountered them in your day-to-day -day life. Part of the reason that uh, this is increasingly popular is, uh, one, the parts you can make are really cool. Uh, you can make fantastically complex geometries that we weren't able to manufacture before, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, but also the number of industrial printers that are available and that offer these high-quality uh, engineering-grade parts, uh, it, they're proliferating. Um, so there's a lot of options at the disposal of engineers and manufacturers today uh, that will enable these 3D printed parts uh, to be used in production applications. Uh, now the tutorial today, we're going to be using uh, some data for our machine learning models. Uh, and that data comes from some real 3D printed parts that were produced in uh, the additive factory at Fast Radius in Chicago. Uh, so these are true production, uh, mock production parts, uh, and they were specifically manufactured using a process called digital light synthesis, or DLS, uh, which is what's being shown here on this slide. Uh, basically, what happens in DLS is you have a UV uh, light projector at the bottom of your printer, and it shines the light up through a, a window into this uh, vat of liquid uh, resin. Uh, so the light cures some of the polymer resin, and as the part hardens, it's drawn out of this liquid bath as if it's growing from liquid. Uh, and if you haven't seen videos online, I, I highly suggest you take a look at YouTube. Uh, it's quite fascinating to watch. Uh, when we talk about quality of parts, uh, specifically in additive, uh, you know, the most frequently asked question we hear uh, is, how do I know if my parts are good, right? Companies and industries are itching to get into additive, but they don't know how to qualify their parts. Uh, and we don't have decades of experience as we do with traditional manufacturing uh, to inform us on how to do that. And with additive, there's a couple extra challenges that we need to overcome in order to qualify these parts. Uh, so first off, uh, the accuracy of parts 
uh, changes from design to design, uh, printer to printer, and even depending on specific settings used on an individual machine. Uh, the other thing is that additive is toolless by nature, meaning that there's not a specific tool tied to the machine to make a specific part, uh, and you have to overhaul everything in order to change your production line. Uh, additive is flexible in that you can produce uh, one part one minute and then immediately switch it to a different part for the next run and then switch back if you want. Uh, so you have this variability in your production volumes. You have constant design changes that are available. Uh, and this is one of the hallmarks of additive, but it also makes qualification uh, all the more difficult. Uh, and then finally, with these complex geometries that we can finally make using additive uh, that we couldn't make before, uh, these complex geometries, without a, a way of predicting their quality, uh, by nature, they're, they're very difficult to inspect. Uh, and so we don't really have a good way of assessing their quality. All right, so this leads us to our ultimate goal of, you know, can we somehow predict uh, the accuracy or the quality of these parts based on, uh, in this case, we're going to be looking at uh, manufacturing parameters and some aspects about the part design itself. Right. And so this birthed the, the research question that we uh, approached as a group at U of I. To, to tackle this, we designed a study in which we uh, fabricated 405 additive parts. Right. And on the right, we show uh, some examples of what these parts looked like. Uh, they're fairly simple, but they were designed to represent some realistic parts that you might see in a factory. So we've themed these a, a clip, a plug, and a bracket. We uh, manufactured these, like I said, in the production facility at Fast Radius, um, mimicking what we would do for a typical production run order, uh, meaning we arrange the parts in a couple different layouts, uh, we used a couple different materials as if you were exploring different applications, uh, and we made the parts on multiple machines. Right? And we record all this information about how the parts were made, the location, uh, the parameters used to go into it, and we also measured the dimensions of each of these parts. All right, so we have this huge data set, uh, over 2,000 measurements in terms of uh, geometric features, and uh, well over 10,000 uh, features pertaining to how the parts were made. And so this is an excellent opportunity uh, to explore the use of machine learning, which traditionally needs larger data sets. Uh, but it's an excellent opportunity for us to leverage machine learning uh, in order to try and predict the part geometry based on all of those manufacturing parameters we recorded. And we actually published this research uh, not too long ago, um, and uh, the link is down below for anyone who's curious to read it. But this tutorial is, is, again, it's based on this research. So when you're working through the entire machine learning process, um, the, the start can be filled with a lot of uh, application-specific and perhaps tedious tasks. Uh, so we've actually gone ahead and we're going to be leveraging a lot of the work we already did for our research study. Uh, and so we won't need to do that today. Um, but so we, we've gone ahead, we're using the parts we manufactured from our research study, uh, the measurement data that we've compiled, and we're also using the features that we uncovered uh, through data exploration that explain a lot of the variance in these 3D printed parts. Uh, what we're going to be focusing on today is the, the right-hand side of the screen, which is where we actually uh, get to develop and build the machine learning model itself, and then make those predictions on uh, part geometry. Uh, so that's the exciting stuff, and that's what we're going to be getting into here shortly. Uh, for those uh, less familiar with machine learning, I want to demystify uh, that term a little bit, uh, because it's not quite as uh, magical as uh, you might believe. So machine learning simply is a computational method for determining either a best fit equation or some form of mathematical model uh, using specific data observations. All right, so a lot of people might say machine learning is a black box. You have some inputs, you have some outputs. You want to be able to connect them, but you don't know what fits inside the box. All right? And all machine learning is doing is we're going to take some known inputs and some known outputs, and we're going to figure out what the equation is inside the black box that connects those inputs and outputs. 
right? So this is particularly well suited uh, to find relationships in high dimensional data, very complex data sets, nonlinear data, et cetera. Um, so it has a lot of advantages, but really it, it's fundamentally a very simple mathematical problem. Uh, so just to show us a, a simple example here on the bottom, uh, let's say we want to use machine learning to determine the equation of either a line or a nonlinear curve. Uh, we have some inputs, you know, y and x. And for a line, we know the equation of a line is y equals mx plus b, or in this case, represented with coefficients uh, c0 and c1. Uh, so what we do with machine learning is we take several of these uh, observations. Uh, we would <clears throat> then basically fit a line to the data, and we can draw uh, out the coefficients from that line. Right? So we know the slope, we know the intercept, we would lock down that equation, the y equals mx plus b, uh, and then we go and see how well does that line fit the remaining observations that we're trying to predict. Same thing's true as the problem gets more and more complex. Okay, on the right, we have some unknown function of x. We'd pull some data, we'd figure out what mathematical function maps x and y, and then we would use that function to try and predict uh, y based on our observations x. Uh, so really, beneath it all, it's uh, a fairly simple mathematical problem. And of course, it can get more and more complex uh, as you develop more and more uh, complex and advanced machine learning algorithms. Uh, what we're dealing with today is a relatively simple um, model. Uh, and specifically, it's that support vector regression model, right? this SVR. Uh, it's quite similar to linear regression, uh, but there's three key differences I want to highlight today. Uh, so the first is that uh, SVR can fit both linear and nonlinear data sets. And the way that works is it takes the data and it will map it into a linear space using a kernel function and a support vector. Right, so these are two uh, parameters that are uh, functions of the machine learning model itself. They're learned during the training process um, and it allows us to basically apply a linear fit to forms of nonlinear data. Uh, the second point is that uh, when we're performing the fits, we're actually fitting a hyperplane to the data. Uh, so what this means is that uh, if your data lies in, in dimensional space, uh, the hyperplane is n minus one dimensions. So in, in two dimensions on the screen, we have you know, one dimensional line fits the data. In three dimensions, we'd have a two-dimensional surface or plane that fits the data, uh, and so on, as you get more and more dimensions. Uh, the third point is that we can define a level of acceptable error, in this case represented by epsilon. So it's a buffer region around our line. Uh, and that acceptable error uh, is basically we're taking any points that fall within that buffer region as correct predictions. Right, so we don't need to fall perfectly on the line, but we can fall close to the line or the hyperplane. Uh, and this might seem trivial, uh, but it actually has a, a fairly significant influence on uh, how the model fits the data. Uh, so there's a few knobs that you, we can tweak here. Uh, we'll get into what those are called later, um, but know that when we select SVR, it's not just a fixed uh, form of machine learning, uh, but we actually can uh, tune it a little bit based on what our data looks like. So as we walk through the tutorial today, I want to put this image in front of you early uh, to see the framework that we're going to be working with. Uh, so again, before we get going, like we have to collect the measurement data. Uh, we perform a little bit of data exploration in order to identify our inputs. Uh, but once we have all of that figured out, uh, the next steps are truly to uh, start going through the cycle where we uh, split the data into uh, some training data and some testing data. All right, this training data is going to be what's used for building our initial model or figuring out what's inside that machine learning black box. Uh, and that training process up top, uh, the end goal is to build the model, uh, but during that process we can perform a couple different things such as cross-validation or hyperparameter tuning. Uh, we'll cover when and why you'd want to do that. Uh, but ultimately, we're coming out with that trained model. 
right? So we get that model, that equation, we lock it down, and then we go to the testing data, which has never been used to train the model before. Uh, we'll run that withheld testing data through our model, and then we'll compare the predictions versus the measured values. Right? And this is how we're going to be evaluating the predictive accuracy of our model. So we'll record that accuracy, uh, and then we can go back and cycle through this again. We'll shuffle the data, we'll split it into training and testing sets, we'll build an entirely new model, we'll test it and evaluate it and record it, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we'll cover why we want to iterate and do this multiple times as well. So I'm breaking this talk into uh, two sections. So we're going to cover some of the, the initial groundwork. Uh, we'll talk it through slides, and then we'll get into the code. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about the machine learning model itself, how we might build it up, some of the, the intricacies of it, and then we'll hop back to the code and build up that model and see the results. Uh, so just to give us some background, on uh, the initial groundwork. Again, exploratory data analysis, it's very important. I didn't want to spend time going through that process today, but I do want to educate this group on the importance of it and, and how you might approach this exploration. Uh, so oftentimes it requires domain expertise uh, and very much creativity. Uh, so one common way to start data exploration is just to plot the histogram of your measurements. Um, so on the left here is just a histogram showing all of the uh, measurements from our parts. Uh, specifically, the feature DFT is the difference from target. So it's the difference between what we measured on the part and what we had designed the part to measure. So we see a roughly normal distribution, but clearly there's something going on uh, within this data. And uh, through the process of exploration, what we found is uh, one uh, variable in particular that separated our data into three classes on the right, and we see those three classes, uh, each of them uh, you, more or less a normal distribution with its own mean and standard deviation, uh, but they explain a lot of the variations that we see in uh, the histogram on the left. So as you go through this process, you'll find more and more features or variables that that uh, explain the variability in your data, uh, and you'll collect these and eventually have a handful of, of variables that you might use as inputs to your machine learning model. Right? And in this case, we're going to use the variables that we found during our research in order to help us predict part geometry. Uh, the second groundwork I want to lay is uh, the idea of the data split. Right? So if you don't split your data into training and testing data, uh, you actually have no proven predictive capability of your model. Right? You can't uh, measure your predictive accuracy uh, for something that you built with the data that you built it with. All right? It's like saying that you're perfect because you designed something to do uh, exactly what you're trying to predict. Uh, so instead, what we do is we split the data. We'll build a model using uh, just the subset of the data, in this case, we call it training set. Uh, and then eventually we'll lock down that model, that equation, and we'll evaluate it on the testing set, which was never used to train the model. Uh, so the simple case is where we just divide it into the training and testing sets. Uh, you can get more complex and advanced. Uh, the example I'll, I'll uh, preview is where we actually split the data into uh, some specified amount of training data a specified amount of testing data, as well as uh, some data that remains uh, left over and will not be used at all. Uh, so why would you want to do this? Why would you want to use all your data? Well, sometimes we want to see how much data is necessary to train a model, especially in environments where uh, getting training data can be very expensive or difficult, such as with manufacturing. Uh, so we know in future cases, we don't need to collect as much data in order to get a successful model. And so we'll see uh, a couple examples of both of these as we go through uh, the code. So I want to transition now uh, to the Jupyter Notebook. While we wait, a question came in, is it possible to predict the equation of a curve with nonlinear function using trees method or machine learning? Uh, the answer is... Yes, I believe, if I'm understanding correctly, uh, you can use a decision tree in order to predict some nonlinear functions. 
we will actually be comparing SVR to a decision tree as well as uh, k-nearest neighbors models at the end of this tutorial. Uh, so for those uh, new to Jupyter Notebooks, uh, just a brief background on what it is. Uh, basically, it's a, a nice way of displaying and viewing uh, Python code. Uh, you have uh, individual cells in the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, some of the cells contain just text. Uh, some of the cells contain actual code. All right. Each of the cells you can uh, run and execute independent of one another. Uh, and the variables uh, that you define and create in each cell uh, get carried on throughout the rest of the notebook. Uh, so if we defined something early on, we can reference it later on in the, the Jupyter Notebook. Um, so while we're here, if everyone can do me a favor, head up to a kernel and then hit this restart and clear output button. Uh, that's just going to give us a, a fresh view so we don't have uh, the answers already shown for us. And then we'll head down to this first section where we're importing libraries. Now to run the code, you can either click this run button in the upper menu. Uh, there's another run button on the side, uh, or you can do uh, a control enter or a shift enter uh, to run the cell. So I, I prefer to use control enter. Um, so you might not see me clicking. But I'm going to run this first cell, and it's just importing the relevant libraries that we need. Um, so a library in Python is basically uh, a, it's a pointer to where some useful functions lie within Python. Uh, so it allows us to basically access those functions. Uh, and I'll point out specifically uh, this sklearn or scikit-learn library that we're using. Um, this has a lot of the machine learning functions that we're going to be leveraging today. Um, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, capability in this library past what we'll uh, discover today. Um, and they have a, a very good help documentation uh, at their website that's linked in that uh, top section up here for the scikit-learn.org. So I'd encourage you, if, if you're interested, go back and, and check that out. Uh, in section two, we're going to uh, read in the data uh, that we collected during our research. Uh, just to give you a preview of what it looks like, this is the first uh, five rows. So the columns are each of our uh, manufacturing parameters that we collected. Uh, and then finally, this column DFTMM, uh, this is going to be our target prediction variable. Um, so this is actually the accuracy of our printing that we're going to be uh, trying to predict. Uh, if you wanted to see uh, just the columns uh, or the names of those variables, uh, you can actually print it out using this uh, function here. Uh, in section three, um, just a brief overview again of the data exploration. Uh, we're going to define a helper function here for a histogram plot. I'm not going to get into the details of what it does. Uh, but it will help us create some nice visualizations in the next cell, uh, which we can visualize all of the data and kind of the distribution that fits it. Uh, and then a couple example variables where we're trying to see how much variance they explain. All right, so in this case, uh, the layout variable uh, doesn't actually seem to separate any of our data, so it, it doesn't explain very much variance, so it might not be a good one to include in our model. And in fact, we don't include it in our model. Uh, but something like feature category, which I won't get into what it is or what it means, um, we can see unique distributions. So this might be a, a very good feature to include in our machine learning model. All right, so you could go through this process uh, for your application and figure out uh, exactly what you might want to use in, in your machine learning model. Now, section four is going to be all about uh, how we perform the data splitting. All right, so I mentioned uh, a couple of simple methods that you could use. Uh, this is going to translate those methods into code for us. Uh, so just for example purposes, we're going to create uh, some demo data list, which is just a list of numbers uh, 0 through 9. Uh, and then uh, we can go through and look at uh, a k-fold cross-validation split. So this method is where we will specify 
uh, the number of folds, so the number of, of iterations we want to go through, uh, and then the number of times we want to repeat the k-fold process. Right? So one unique uh, thing about k-fold, uh, basically the folds is how many uh, groups you divide all of your data into. Uh, so in this case, there's five groups or five folds. And then we split our data using one of the folds for testing uh, and the remaining folds, k minus one folds for training. Uh, and you'll notice there's no repeats uh, within each row. And then we use uh, fold one as testing for the first row, fold two for the next three, four, and five. So there's never any repeats uh, within our testing data, uh, at least for our five folds. A uh, quick question came in. Is it mentioned in the slide? 2,000 features there. Yeah, so um, uh, vocab definition. So for the features shown here, um, a feature in a real world for manufacturing could mean like the a geometric feature on a part that we measured. So in this case, we measured 2,000 uh, geometries or distances, thicknesses, things like that. Uh, in machine learning, feature typically means like your input variables, which would be the column headers here. Um, so I, I may mix those up as we go, I apologize. Um, but generally, I'll try to refer to uh, features or input parameters for machine learning, and I'll try to stick with just uh, an output variable or DFT uh, for what we're trying to predict. Um, if you wanted to see uh, the the length of your data frame, you could actually print out uh, the shape. And you see here we have uh, 2025. OK, hopefully that cleared up a couple of questions here. Yeah, so we see uh, how the k-fold cross-validation works. Uh, I'll cover a little bit more detail on this. Um, but this is one method of splitting your data, basically uh, pulling testing data uh, as a function of 1 over k, so in this case, 20% of our data, uh, and then repeating it k times uh, without repeating uh, any of your test data points. So each of these points occurs once and only once. Uh, another option is this Monte Carlo subsampling. Uh, sometimes it's called uh, a repeated random holdout. Uh, if we run this cell, uh, it'll make a little bit more sense what's going on, so we can specify the number of times we run a uh, randomly select testing and training data sets. Uh, and then we can specify this SF or a sampling fraction, uh, which is the proportion of data we want to use for training. Uh, so in this case, I'm saying 70% or seven points we'll use for training, which leaves us three points for testing. Uh, now, I've set the random state here in our random splitter. Uh, specifically so that we're all aligned and see the same things. Uh, if you want it to truly be random, you can delete this. Uh, but what we'll see here is, uh, since I know everyone sees what I see, uh, our first iteration of going through this, we have a 7 and a 4. Our second iteration, we have a 4. The 7 occurs again. Uh, in fact, 3 pops up three times throughout these five iterations. So instead of uh, pulling our test data, like with uh, k-fold, where we're pulling it without replacement, and we see it exactly, each point exactly one time in our testing data, uh, we're pulling randomly, and we are not guaranteed to see uh, points uh, one time or uh, any number of times, right? It's totally random. It can be anywhere from zero to however many iterations we specify. The next option I want to uh, show everyone is uh, where we perform what's called a dual Monte Carlo subsampling. And this is a, a little bit more advanced than just the Monte Carlo. Uh, this is where we actually specify a sampling fraction and a testing fraction. Uh, and so long as the uh, sum of these two fractions is less than or equal to 100%, uh, this type of approach will work, right? So we we'll have some amount of data left over that we won't use for our machine learning model. Um, so in this case, we specify 50%, uh, so five points for training. Uh, again, three points for testing. Uh, and then we can see some of the points remain unused. Uh, again, this 
sampling process is uh, randomized, so you're not guaranteed to see points any number of times. Um, but it, it provides us a little bit more flexibility. So our training set, we have control over the size of it. It's not just defaulted uh, based on how much we're using for testing. Uh, and the last example before we hop back to the, the slides is uh, where we're pulling all of this together. Um, so we can specify, basically all we're doing is taking uh, this prior cell where we're specifying both a sampling and a testing fraction. And we're going to iterate through a loop where we specify different amounts of sampling fractions. And this will make a little bit more sense when we run the code. Uh, so in the first loop, we're specifying uh, that we want 20% uh, sampling fraction and 30% testing fraction. Right? So in this first set um, of, of samplings, we see three points for testing, two points for training, uh, and the remainder is unused. Right? And we iterate that twice, uh, as we indicated up here. And then we'll go on to the next loop, where we want 40% and 30%. And we can see, again, 30% testing, 40% on the training, uh, and then the unused is what remains. Uh, we can do that again and again, however many times you want, with different sampling and testing fractions. Uh, but the point I want to make is that, remember that random state that we specified, uh, it helps ensure that every time we start the loop for a new testing and sampling fraction, uh, we're guaranteed to get the same randomization of the data. So what this allows us to do is that uh, if we're in the first section up here, uh, whatever model we build using this 20% sampling fraction and evaluate it on our testing data, uh, if we build entirely different models in the second section with more training data, we'll actually be evaluating on the exact same testing data as we did for the prior models where we had different amounts of training data. Uh, so this allows us to build models with the different amounts of training data and ensure that when we're evaluating the models, they are directly comparable to each other. So we can draw some conclusions uh, about you know, how much data we need, how, how quickly the model learns with more and more training data, uh, and how much effort we need to go into to get that training data from our manufacturing facility. Uh, so I want to pause here if everyone can shift their attention back to uh, my slides. I'll just recap uh, some of the uh, important uh, aspects when we're building up the machine learning model. All right. So first we have uh, data standardization. Right. And all this is is a process of transforming our data set to have uh, mean zero and standard deviation one for each of our features or uh, those input parameters to the machine learning model, right? So you can imagine if you have some predictor variables that are measured on different length scales, for example, something measured with hundreds of units and another measured with fractions of units. Uh, if you were to put coefficients in front of each of those, they would be weighted entirely differently, right? Orders of magnitude different. Uh, and in fact, some algorithms uh, are designed to neglect variables with a small magnitude of variance. Uh, so it's very possible that even if your fraction of a unit uh, variable is an excellent predictor, it would be great in your machine learning model, it might simply get thrown out because it's smaller than another variable that you have. Uh, so standardization puts all of our input parameters on a level playing field uh, and ensures that you know, they have a, a standardized standard deviation and also that mean zero. The second concept is hyperparameter tuning. Right? And I briefly mentioned this when we talked about SVR uh, and some of the hyperparameters in SVR. Uh, but what these are is that hyperparameters are the adjustable parameters that help us control the machine learning algorithm. Right? And the tuning process is where we uh, adjust the values of these hyperparameters in order to maximize our predictive performance. Now, I bring this up because uh, performing an exhaustive tuning on hyperparameters is extremely computationally intensive. Uh, it's often skipped over when uh, uh, engineers are building out these machine learning models. And if it's not skipped over, 
shortcuts are often taken. So uh, when we do this process manually, uh, humans can uh, unintentionally introduce bias into the machine learning models. And this happens in a couple ways, either the hyperparameters are tuned on the entire data set, which means that we're basically forming part of our machine learning model with knowledge of both our testing and training data at the same time, uh, which is not uh, the best way to do things. Uh, or we as humans have a great memory for some random trends that we might see in the entire data set, uh, perhaps that we gathered through data exploration. Uh, and that can influence us in how we tune the hyperparameters. So a nice solution, especially for lightweight models like SVR, that we can actually automatically tune these hyperparameters using uh, the code. Um, so a couple options, one of which we'll explore today is this grid search or a random search hyperparameter tuning. All right, so we're gonna use grid search, but what that is is that we can specify a range of hyperparameter values, and then we will systematically test every combination of those hyperparameter values uh, in order to see which uh, combination produces the best uh, model performance. Uh, random search, pretty similar, self-explanatory, we're randomly selecting combinations to test, and then we'll select the best out of those random selections. Okay, uh, the third thing is cross-validation. Right? And we already got a sneak preview of this when we ran the code. Uh, it might make a little bit more sense with some of these figures. Uh, but basically, cross-validation is a technique for helping us assess model predictive performance. Right, so if we evaluate the model just on one testing set, there's a chance that we have some outliers within our testing set that skew our performance results. The process of cross-validation is basically building multiple models with different testing sets and then averaging the performance of all of those models in order to build the expected model performance, right, something that we might expect if we were to release this into the wild. Uh, and there's lots of different methods for performing cross-validation. Uh, the two that we're focusing on today is this k-fold cross-validation and the Monte Carlo subsampling, or that repeated random foldout. So again, we already saw this in the code, but just to reiterate, k-fold cross-validation, we're splitting uh, the data set into uh, k folds. So each row here represents uh, the entire data set that's been divided into uh, k folds. And each row represents uh, a unique split or a unique model that we're going to be building. Uh, so K minus one folds will be used for training, one fold will be used for testing. Uh, and then as we iterate through our different splits or the different models, we select uh, each unique fold one time. So uh, this has a great way of uh, making sure we see every data point in our testing set exactly one time. Now, k-fold is often conservative in its estimate of model performance, meaning that it, it might show your predictive capabilities a little bit lower than it might actually be. Uh, an alternative is this Monte Carlo cross-validation or this, this random holdout, right? And in this case, we can specify how many models we want to want to build or number of iterations. And then we're randomly selecting uh, some amount of data to use for testing. We can go through, again, the testing uh, is shown here as groups. It doesn't need to be groups. They can be totally randomly selected and you're not guaranteed to see uh, the data in your testing set. Okay, so you can see each individual point anywhere from zero to n times in testing sets. Uh, the nice thing about Monte Carlo is, uh, while it's not as conservative as uh, K-fold, so you might uh, overestimate your model prediction performance, uh, the nice thing is that you actually have a direct uh, control over how much data you're using for testing and how much you're using for training. Uh, so you're not tied to using exactly one over K proportion of your data for testing. So it's a little bit more flexible. And the final thing before we hop back to the code is pulling all of these three things uh, together into uh, what we're going to use for our final buildup of the, the model. So this is the nested cross-validation. Um, so we'll start with all of our data. We'll perform some Monte Carlo subsampling on the outside. Again, you'll see uh, this is a more advanced technique where we're determining the amount of training and testing uh, data independently. And then we'll have some data that remains unused. Uh, and then we'll nest a second cross-validation loop inside 
of this outer right? So specifically, we'll take the training data itself, only the training data, and we'll send it to the inner loop, where now we'll perform uh, a nested k-fold cross-validation, right? And this is going to be tied with our hyperparameter tuning, with the automatic hyperparameter tuning. So we'll we'll uh, examine a model with each combination of hyperparameters using k-fold. Uh, then we'll look for the combination of hyperparameters that represent the model with the best performance. We'll take those hyperparameters, we'll take it to the outside loop where we have all the training data and we'll build one single model. Okay, so one model with the determined best hyperparameters on all of the training data. And then we'll lock that equation down, that model down. Right? And then and only then we'll expose it to the testing data. We'll make our predictive uh, our predictions on the testing data and we'll record the predictive accuracy. And then since the outer loop is a cross-validation loop itself, uh, we can go back, reshuffle our data, and repeat the process. All right? And in this way, then we can average uh, the model performance throughout that entire outer loop, and we get uh, a really good estimate of model performance as we might expect to see it operate in the wild. Uh, so this gets uh, fairly advanced, but I'm confident this group can, can handle it, especially when we walk through the tutorial. So I'm gonna switch back to the code here in a second. And we're gonna be on section five, where we finally start building up our support vector regression model. Now, what we're gonna start by doing is uh, we're gonna use a function called dmatrices, just as a helper function. Uh, we're specifying basically uh, how we want our data prepared for the machine learning model. Uh, so in this case, we're showing uh, our target variable y and our input variables x. Uh, y, again, is this DFT measurement. So we see just some, some examples there. And then x is uh, our inputs. Uh, you can see here we have a combination of both categorical and continuous variables. So the categorical variables get uh, encoded as one-hot variables. Um, which just means that uh, it's a zero when, in this case, the material is not RPU, uh, and it's a one when the material is RPU, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's just a, a method of uh, representing categorical variable. Uh, and then we also have the continuous variables. Right? So this isn't too important for the, today's tutorial. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more, there's more in our paper. Um, but just know that we're prepping our data for the machine learning model, right? And now we get to building the model itself. We're going to start out pretty simple. Um, I'm going to run this, and then I'm going to talk about what's going on. Uh, so again, we're specifying uh, a sampling fraction. This is just going to be with a single random pulled out, so Monte Carlo without the repeats. Uh, I want 80% of the data used for training, uh, and we'll use 20% for testing. We'll perform the data split, again, with our random state, and we'll uh, point the estimator to this SVR, right? So this regression estimator will be for SVR. Uh, from the split, we'll create our training sets and our testing sets here. And then we'll input, uh, basically, our, our estimator. We will fit with our X train and Y train data. And then we'll come to uh, actually looking at what our predictions are by predicting based on the X data, the X test data. Right. So there's just a little bit of uh, getting familiar with the syntax in Python and this library, um, but it, the steps should follow pretty closely to what we've talked about so far. Uh, finally, we'll define uh, the RMSE, or the root mean squared error, that's how we're going to be evaluating our model predictive accuracy. Uh, and that'll be a function with uh, just some testing uh, data versus our, our actual predictions. Right? And what we see here is just with a very basic model that we've built up, uh, it's not great performance, not terrible, uh, but we see about 140 microns RMSE, uh, quite a bit of scatter. Uh, if we go to the next cell, uh, I'm going to run this and then talk. All I've done is change one line. This is where we're manually specifying hyperparameters. Right? So in this case, a kernel, a gamma function, and an epsilon. Um, you see some of the default values there. Uh, but this is where we could change hyperparameters. 
And what we'll see is we get a little bit better performance. Now, that's a little bit of dumb luck. It's a little bit of how I set up this tutorial. Uh, but you can see how changing the hyperparameters uh, impacts the performance of your model. Right? So now we're down to about 100 microns. Uh, and then the next example, uh, instead of hyperparameter tuning, we're just going to perform uh, the data standardization using this standard scalar function. Uh, and all we're doing, this pipeline function, it's basically saying, take our data, standardize it, and then send it to the SVR model. Uh, so it's just a, a one, two step here. And when we run this, uh, we'll see uh, quite a bit of significant improvement here just because now all our variables are on a level playing field, uh, we're down to just under 60 microns prediction accuracy. Now I know I'm going fast, uh, but the, the next thing I wanna cover is just this grid search hyperparameter tuning. Um, so in this case, uh, our grid search hyperparameter tuning, if you recall, we're gonna tie it to a k-fold cross-validation. Uh, so in this case, again, we, we specify our estimator, which we're gonna use this pipeline function for. Uh, our parameter grid is specified by some inputs. In this case, we have uh, two unique gammas and three unique epsilons, so six total combinations. If we run this uh, through the k-fold CV process, when we output the results, we'll see six uh, output results based on uh, our six models that we built. We can look at the hyperparameters used for each of these models each of the rows. We can see some of the scores, the, the prediction capabilities. Uh, and if we come down, we can actually pull the best score from that matrix uh, and see what hyperparameters were used, what the prediction capability is. So uh, when we pull it all together, um, so this is where we're gonna start getting some cool results. I want everyone to do me a favor and come up to uh, cell. And we're just gonna say run all below because some of these will take a little bit to run. It'll take you to the bottom of the page, just scroll back up uh, to the pull it all together section here. So while this is running, I'll explain what we're doing. Uh, so we're specifying different sampling fractions to run through. So in this case, we're moving uh, from 10% to 90% in increments of, this should be 10%. Uh, we specify test fractions as 10% of all our data. Again, we, we're going to run through nine iterations. Uh, and we're going to use five outer folds in that Monte Carlo subsampling. Our inner folds for k-fold CV is going to be three. Uh, and then we just have uh, an empty data frame that we can write some uh, results to. Again, we're just putting pieces together here to pull it together uh, a for loop for each of our sets of testing and, and training fractions. Uh, we'll randomly shuffle the data, create our test and train sets. Then we'll get into the inner k-fold uh, cross-validation with the hyperparameter tuning. And then we'll record our results. Right? So our results specifically, we're gonna have um, our best score from the inner k-fold. This is called a validation score. Uh, and then we'll evaluate our score based on training data for our training score and testing data for our testing score, right? And what we see, uh, again, since we're running through uh, nine combinations of sampling fractions and five uh, iterations, we're actually gonna end up with 45 uh, models that have been built and recorded. Uh, we can uh, run some averaging on this data uh, just to simply uh, report, you know, one score for each set of those outer cross-validation loops. Uh, and then what I'm going to do in this uh, next cell is we're going to plot those results. All right, so specifically we're looking at the uh, testing score in blue. So this is our predictions on the test data. Uh, and then our training score in orange. All right, and uh, what we see is the testing data uh, as we add more and more data to our training up our model, we're basically using more information to build that model. Our testing score comes down uh, and gets better. Uh, and our training score uh, comes up. This is a, a artifact of us 
uh, overfitting the data in the beginning because we don't have very many observations. So it's easy to draw a line between two points. It's a little bit harder as you have three and four and five and so on. Uh, and eventually, uh, we see the two converge. Right? So when you're trying to evaluate your machine learning model, uh, you don't want to be in this overfitting region. Uh, you don't necessarily want to be in uh, the far right region because it requires a lot of training data. Uh, generally, there's some compromise in the middle. Uh, now, I said we're going to compare different machine learning algorithms. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I realize we're almost at time here. Um, but all you need to do is uh, basically we're going to be using a, a different estimator in each of these next cells. So instead of SVR, we're using a K nearest neighbors. Or in the next one, we're using a decision tree regressor. Similarly, we're recording all the results. And then I'm going to plot uh, just the testing error for each of these models. And what we see is uh, SVR performs best. Uh, for all sampling fractions for this data. Um, again, that, that's why we chose SVR for this uh, tutorial. Uh, but also, you can extend this to exploring different machine learning algorithms. Uh, the infrastructure is very much the same and, and very interchangeable. Um, you just need to update this estimator function, what it's pointing to, uh, and then your parameter grid might change for uh, different hyperparameter tunings or uh, your different functions have different types of hyperparameters. So uh, very easy to sub in and out uh, different algorithms that are available through the scikit learning library. With that, I'll uh, switch back just to a, a quick summary slide. You know, we discussed in this tutorial some very simple steps to help us maintain unbiased machine learning models. Uh, we have this data standardization trick we can use. Uh, we know how to randomly split our data into testing and training and incorporate some nested cross-validation. Uh, that'll help us get a good estimate of the predictive capability. Uh, and then finally, the automated hyperparameter tuning can help eliminate some uh, unconscious or unknowing bias creeping into our models. Uh, and the other thing we demonstrated, uh, you know, the SVR model actually can uh, predict the geometry of AM parts uh, pretty well. Um, we get down to about 53 micron error, which is uh, very close to uh, our measurement uncertainty and also just some random variations on the printers themselves. Um, and again, I encourage you, uh, if you are curious to learn more, um, please take a look at that uh, publication online. If you don't have access, send me an email. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or provide you a copy of the paper. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Well, let's uh, thank Davis uh, for a terrific presentation. This is really nice. Um, and uh, there is one question from um, Bartos in the Q&A. I know we're running out of time, uh, so maybe we can have a quick question. Could you explain what is the purpose of unused sets of data when you divide up the data? Yeah. Um, so this is a good question. I'm actually going to go back to this slide uh, to talk about the unused sets. So uh, specifically in this application, we were uh, wanting to explore how much training data is necessary uh, to build a sufficient machine learning algorithm. Right. And the reason we care about this is collecting training data in a manufacturing environment is not easy. Uh, it can be time consuming. It can be expensive. Uh, so while we have all the data for our research project, uh, we don't necessarily have all the data for future applications. So in this sense, if we can show that a model trained on a fraction of the data and evaluated on the exact same testing data set, uh, if we can show that we have a pretty good uh, prediction accuracy with less data, then there's a, an incentive to collect less training data. Uh, so that's the biggest advantage of seeing that. Okay, very good. So in the interest of time, uh, let's stop here. Let's all thank um, Davis again uh, for a great presentation.